Hi, I'm Stephen Calabria, and we are at the world-famous Comedy Cellar in Manhattan's West Village. I am joined by former extremist turned counter-terrorism expert Mubeen Sheikh, and we will be talking about terrorism. Welcome, sir. Thank you. So, can you give us a little uh, overview of your background? Sure. Um, so, I'm born and raised in Toronto, Canada, uh, where I went to Quran school by evening time uh, versus public school by daytime. It was night and day difference. Uh, you know, the, the, the Quran school is, you know, boys sitting at wooden benches, rocking back and forth, reading the Quran, not understanding what we're reading. Public school is the opposite, boys and girls mixing, caring, nurturing environment. Uh, leads me to an identity crisis that I have in my teenage years. Uh, I ended up going to India and Pakistan. In Pakistan, I would have a chance encounter with the Taliban. Uh, I was bit by the jihadi bug, as I call it. Uh, returned back to Canada and uh, fell into the extremist circles, recruiting other kids, um, going on you know, with this grievance-based ideology uh, until the 9-11 attacks, which forced me to reconsider my, my, my commitment to the cause. I then spent two years in Syria, where I learned the Quran, Arabic and Islamic studies, uh, realizing that this is not the way, I uh, de-radicalized while I was there, returned back to Canada, um, became an operative for the uh, Canadian Security Intelligence Service, where I worked undercover for two years, uh, online and on the ground infiltrations, uh, culminating in 2006 with the arrest of 18 guys, it was a big terrorism case, spent four years in court. Uh, 2010, when the court was over, got online, discovered this whole ISIS foreign fighter phenomenon happening in real time. So I engaged with ISIS foreign fighters uh, in real time on Twitter, Facebook. Um, and uh, since then, I've just been, uh, you know, I work very closely with U.S. government agencies, uh, other agencies on counterterrorism. Okay, so how old were you when you were radicalized? I was uh, 19. Okay. 19 and years old. Can you walk us through the process of how exactly a person becomes radicalized? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I look at three, three trajectories. I look at the one who's born into a Muslim family, who's been indoctrinated from, from childhood, and then later on just you know, goes down that road where they move to violent action. A second category would be somebody who's born in a Muslim family, is exposed to religion, but there's no politics. And then a third is, let's say, they don't grow up with any religion, and they go on their way. Now for all, I guess, I mean, for the first category, they just go into violent extremism because of the indoctrination. For the second and third, there has to be a point where the, where the indoctrination occurs. And that's usually because of something that's precipitated it. So uh, some kind of uh, uh, problem that happens in their life. It could be the death of a loved one, uh, the loss of some, something significant. Um, for me, it was a house party that I had and I invited all my friends over and long story short my super conservative uncle walked in on the party you know beard robe turban uh, turban and robes and as far as he was concerned I had dishonored the family I had defiled the home so shame and guilt forced me to think okay how can I fix this so I thought okay if I get religious I can do away I can clear away these these wrong things that I've done and so that's what got me into it. I, I decided to go to India and Pakistan, and that was the thing that precipitated that. So this, this great crisis that happened to me based on this identity crisis, and then suddenly being introduced uh, to that ideology. And so that's how I got into it. Okay, and so then you moved overseas and you moved to Syria to study the Quran? That that's was, right. That was after you were de-radicalized? So actually, what, after I came back from Pakistan for the next five years, I recruited other kids, um, engaging in this kind of, and really watching it grow from pre-Bin uh, Laden times. I mean, this is 1995. Uh, Bin Laden's fatwa comes out in 1998. Uh, then we have the 9-11 attack. So in that time, there was a lot of grievance-based ideology. The Muslims are being attacked. I'm a Muslim. I need to do something about it. And, and for a lot of people, it's that simple. Uh, you know, so a lot of these kids who are watching this stuff, who in their normal lives, they're, they're nobodies. I mean, they're, they have no real meaningful existence. And now you're given a chance to do that. You can be a hero. So you go from zero to hero overnight. You're, you're you know, eulogized, you're lionized in these videos. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're watching these things, people suffering, it moves you to action. And so this is uh, what a lot of kids go through, even for us at that time. Where there were no, there was no inter. Well, there was internet, but not like it is today. So it started off with VHS videos, 
then CDs. It's going back a while. It's going back a while. Yeah, like right. mid nineties, I could say AOL chat, Yahoo chat, just text based uh, internet I barely even social. That. Yeah, 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 that's that's the social networking at that time. So today, what you see is the speed at which the information is made available and the content is so professionally produced that when you're sitting in front of that screen and you're consuming that day in and day out for many, many hours a day, it's impossible for you not to be affected. It's infectious. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it that you think that most Americans don't know about terrorism and radicalization in particular that you think they should? Okay, um, there's a great quote um, that it goes, uh, ideology without grievances doesn't resonate. And grievances without ideology are not acted on. So it's wrong to say that it's only religion or it's only foreign policy. It's a mix of both. Sometimes the religious ideology is the driver and other times it's a passenger with other psychosocial factors as the driver. So it's very complex. It's as complex as we are human beings. I mean. We take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, you don't know where the person is coming from. They could come from an abused background. They could come from a middle-class background where they're not deprived. But when they're watching these videos, they see the deprivation of their people. And so what they do is they take on that deprivation as their own deprivation. So that's called vicarious deprivation. So this is why when we ask, what makes a kid from middle-class da-da-da do that? Well, that's why. Uh, so that's something to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, on radicalization, uh, there are two, two concepts. There's uh, radicalization, which in and of itself is not a bad thing. I mean, to have extreme political views is, is normal and natural. But it's the violent radicalization that, that worries us. It's where the, the trajectory will lead you into violence. So what I would want you to understand is that not all radicalized people become violent extremists. Right, okay. Now, we're having a debate here at the Comedy Cellar this evening about the issue of terrorism, specifically, is terrorism a threat to the American way of life? And you have taken the position that it is not. Correct. Why do you think that is? What is a persuasive argument to Americans who are scared, justifiably, yep. that terrorism does not present a threat to them and their lives? Yeah, I think, I mean, one can argue both sides. And I mean, I'm sure I can do just as good a job as on the, on the yes side. But since I have the no side, I think um, I, would, I would sort of spin it to say it's not the terrorism that's the threat to your way of life. It's the responses to terrorism. It's the losing of liberties, first and foremost, right? Uh, if those who sacrifice liberty for security deserve neither, famous quote. Uh, so I think uh, the real threat I mean, there have been other societies that have been faced with terrorism. They're still around. Um, you know, it has not been an existential threat. Uh, even now, what you're dealing with is really, if pardon the phrase, it's nuisance terrorism. You know, it's one guy, two guys, you know, a, a low level, low casualty attack. Um, and that's not going to bring your society down. Uh, it's when we start to remove liberties, we start to dispense, I mean, do away with your values, with our values. I, I consider myself very Western now. Uh, when we do away with those values, that is what will bring us down. It's not them doing what they do. Terrorism has been around for a long, 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 long time. I mean, it peters out. Because at the end of the day, terrorism doesn't work, right? Societies don't change uh, on the basis of terrorist demand. So I think we'll see the same thing. You'll continue to see these attacks. I mean, this is the reality. Uh, of, of wars that have been happening in the Middle East, the ideologies that legitimize resistance to those wars, ideologies that, re that, that legitimize killing of civilians, that will always be a natural, I think, output from this context of wars in their lands. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, they won't win. Well, that's it for my questions. Is there anything else you wanted to say? No, I think, uh, I think the main thing is just to understand the ideology, the grievances, and radicalization. And I think most importantly, uh, when people say that religion, uh, Islam in particular, uh, Islam is very unequivocally against terrorism. Jihad is a war tradition that has rules of engagement. Terrorism are considered crimes of war, even under Islamic law. Uh, so no matter what kind of costume they might put on and say that what we're doing is Islamic, the vast majority of the Muslim world will tell you it's not. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. Most welcome. I'm Stephen Calabria at the world famous Comedy Cellar in Manhattan's West Village. Thank you very much for watching. You can find more information about our debates at the website www.comedycellar.com.